like to give everybody out there listening a very warm White Cat welcome because you're tuned in to the White Cat Outdoors podcast. What's going on, guys? Episode 26 of the White Cat Outdoors podcast. We have a packed house here tonight. Uh, Tom showed up. He, he missed last week, but he's here. Back in action, boys. And Nick, after being gone for most of last week's episode, showed up again. Hey, what's going on? But uh, for the record, I was there the whole time, just wasn't on the mic. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not believing it. And uh, another guy that you guys already know, he's been on a couple podcasts in the past. It's uh, my dad, Frank Myers. Nice to hear he's all again out there. I had to bribe these guys hard this time to get back on. <laughs> yeah, we are getting pretty <laughs> tired of you. <laughs> And uh, we got my uncle and Nick and Tom's dad on the podcast for the first time. It's Todd Sobolewski. How's everybody doing out there? Glad to be here. Yeah, and uh, you know, as you guys just figured out, we got both of our dads on for the podcast because it's Father's Day. So for all you fathers out there listening, thanks for listening and happy Father's Day. Yeah, appreciate it uh, because you guys are the ones that are getting everybody outdoors. So much appreciated. Um, this week's podcast, like you said, it's Father's Day special. Uh, we brought both of our dads on because that's who got us involved in the outdoors. Um, and we just want to kind of show our appreciation for them and bring them on because, you know, we owe a lot of what we know to them and, you know, our grandpas and everybody that gets to celebrate Father's Day. Um, everybody knows Uncle Frank. He's been on a few episodes. Um, but Todd here, my dad, um, we refer to as both and Uncle Todd throughout the night, um, we don't know you yet. Well, I know you. The listeners don't. <laughs> Some of us but, know. <laughs> um, so I guess just give us a little rundown uh, who you are and what you like to do outside. outside. Um, I got involved in the outdoors, ironically, from my father as well. And uh, I just really took a liking to being out in nature. Um, and the, just the family traditions, the going to hunting camp, uh, but he's also an avid fisherman. He's always had boats his whole life, so we've been out on the water. We've been in the woods. Um, it's just a relaxing and enjoyable time, and it's just something that he brought me into, and I shared with my boys, and a couple of them took on to hunting. One took on to fishing, and, I mean, it's just whatever your preference is. I mean, there's no right or wrong. I just I really enjoy nature in general and being outdoors. Yeah, we, we actually, we got into trapping together. Um, I, don't, I don't actually, I don't, did you do much trapping growing I, up? I did not. My father never, he trapped when he was younger and then uh, got involved in the adult life and going to work every day and kind of gave up on the on the trap and didn't have time and for he it. He got and, out of it when the market was high too, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I really never had anybody that showed me how to go trapping. And then uh, I think it might have been, Uncle Frank showing you boys how the, it was the done. The coon dogs actually, I think, was a lot of it too, because we needed practice for the dogs. <laughs> yeah. Um, so but. you guys, you guys brought me into trapping, and I really, really enjoyed coon trapping and beaver muskrats. We've caught some ducks and squirrels. <laughs> and some, some <laughs> never know what you're gonna get in a foot there, trap. There's yeah. always a non-target animal in there someplace. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I mean, you. He said ducks and, I mean, snapping turtles, everything. It just, you never know. But Yeah, we've had a pair of blackbirds sitting in there together. Um, yeah, you just <laughs> caught them never... both in one trap. <laughs> yeah, it was in a box trap. We were trapping coons. I mean, like you said, it's it's not illegal. We're not targeting them. They're, it just happens. But but we actually, me and my dad caught, what was the 53-pounder? Up That's, at the White Cat Outdoors headquarters of Beaver. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know us, my dad was actually the previous owner of the White Cat Outdoors headquarters. He was generous enough to gift that over to me and my brother. But he's been going up there for I don't know how long. Oh, a good 30 years. Anyway, uh, my dad and a, his old business partner um, had owned it prior to me owning it. And uh, I had it probably for close to 20 years and then the boys showed a great interest in it and it just happened to work out to their advantage that they're now the proud owners 
Yeah, definitely our advantage because nothing much changed except taxes. <laughs> and our, it, it showed up with my name on them now. So yeah, so you I, still get to use it, Uncle Todd. You just don't got to pay say, for yeah, it. Yeah, I think uh, I think my dad had outsmarted us on this one. That was his the years of wisdom that got us on that one. It'll, it'll but, win uh, out every it, time for sure. <laughs> you know, it's just you know, Which it's like does. Remind me, we have to discuss the taxes because you were paying half and Tom was supposed to pay the other half, but I told him I would help him out till he got out of college. That and is true. Now he's employed, so it looks like the next one's coming straight to you. Yeah, I guess that's only fair. That is true. <laughs> Time to start garnishing wages. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, talk to that guy you work one. for and see yeah. if he can't help you out. <laughs> but yeah, for those of you that don't know, I'm actually working for my dad now, so we're spending even more time together. And we're actually getting ready to do some serious farming here up at the headquarters. Oh, actually, yeah, that's a pretty good announcement we could make. Um, the newest equipment we just got acquired for getting stuff done at the new farms and everything. Yeah, we just got a 18-foot steel trailer all diamond plated out. Pretty serious that that's going to take our tractor up to the headquarters and do some farming. Um, we have maybe like six acres worth of planting to do and me and my dad have enough seeds and fertilizer and lime to do about 12 acres <laughs> you so. guys you got like a whole smorgasbord like ready for a hobby farm out there but <laughs> we'll figure it out some of the food plots just might have to grow a little bit more overseeded <laughs> a little bit being it's the first year it's being planted but I want to jump back to the trailer real quick. Does this have anything to do with using Sam's trailer? <laughs> uh, yeah, we yeah. Can, let's touch on that for just a second. We found out, uh, we crunched some numbers. Uh, it was actually cheaper to buy new uh, than use a friend's. <laughs> <laughs> so, What'd you break? <laughs> so let's just give a rundown here. So our buddy Sam, uh, he's the one that wrote that fine intro you t- all just listened to. Um, he, you know, we're getting ready to do some planning. Uh, so... I was last week or the week before. Yeah, we had, I think it was two weeks. Two, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, we you know went to go out and prep the fields, brush hog, get ready for spraying and all that. And we didn't. Well, we had a trailer lined up um, from a friend of ours. He said last minute. Oh, by the way, it's not inspect or no, it didn't have lights brakes, and no brakes. Brakes and lights weren't working. Um, and we had quite the haul, so we said you know thanks, but no thanks. Um, Sam got a hold of us. Oh, I got a trailer. Uh, all you got to do, I would buy a spare. So, you know, in case there's just a problem. Just in case. Which, I mean. He said you shouldn't have a problem, but so just I, in that's, case. That's fair. Uh, so we went, bought a tra- or bought a spare. Actually, Tom bought a spare. Um, got all the way up there. Um, rode fine. But when we got there, one of the tread, or the tires, uh, the tread on the tires was completely gone. It had now turned, you just see all the, my dad actually pricked himself with, the wires it was that bald sounds like uh, a bearing yeah. issue <laughs> so we uh replaced the one tire and when we put it up on the block realized that the other th- well two other ones because this actually goes back even further yeah, there's a story before that one that has to do with me <laughs> um so two other tires had also been totally dry rotted and needed replaced um only reason it was just two other ones is frank had recently replaced a tire when he hauled something up there so i think sam needs to rent it out two more times and he'll have new tires all the way ready to go um but it's the, the slickest <laughs> way you guys should take notes once your tires start going bad on the new trailer just, just start, start loaning it to yeah. people <laughs> works great uh we actually ripped the light housing out of one of the lights because when the tread came flying off it so it was i mean it was a big big mess but we were, i mean we were actually to be truthful we were looking at buying a trailer anyway um just didn't Still line up buying one and a half trailers yeah exactly <laughs> it, like um, our this good buddy, made our decision a lot easier yeah <laughs> our good buddy trevor he always says we'll laugh about it later and i'm sure this is one of those situations where well I, we're laughing about it now so this is only two weeks so it is later and we're laughing so didn't take long no, no not, so, <laughs> not too long at all I'm, we're over it but yeah we got our new trailer and i don't even we have beans so, or soybeans, chicory, clover, brassica, and radishes. radishes, and then there's buckwheat. we got some like no-till bags like that you get at field and stream and stuff that for small killer plots. But yeah, so coming up in a couple weekends here, we're going to be doing some farming up there with my dad. Hopefully, producing some big bucks. My dad had the rain for I don't know how long. The 
biggest buck up there. Why don't you tell that, that massive hunting story? Seven point. <laughs> Before we get to that buck story, because that is a great way to lead into this, um, but this is also related to climber. Um, Owen Zimmer, who we had on a couple weeks ago, that was you know manages whitetail properties and stuff, had contacted me. Um, he listened to our podcast on putting food plots on the headquarters, and he made a suggestion that I just wanted to throw out because i haven't talked to you guys yet about it um he said you pretty if, much always do this when somebody talks to you you're like oh, i'm not going to tell them until we're on you know yeah, recording it gives us yeah, something so to talk we about look like dirt bags if we tell you you're dumb <laughs> yeah but it's not because it makes a lot of sense um and it's coming from owen who knows what he's talking about as long so. as it's coming from owen and not you i'll listen yeah it did not come from me this isn't <laughs> out of my brain uh i'm just the messenger here but owen had mentioned possibly um fencing off and th- this isn't just for us but um for anybody, um, fencing off a small section of the soybeans um, to if you're if you plan to hunt it late season, fencing it off so the deer can't get to that section and you can kind of use it to your advantage on stand location. Um, if you're doing a big enough area, if you're doing a small plot of it, but if you're doing a large food plot, which I think we're what two and a half acres we're doing. I think two acres. Yeah. Two acres. So he suggest not really suggested, but even just threw out the idea of maybe fencing off a quarter acre. Um, just to keep the deer out of that and then late season open it up. And it, he said a lot of times we'll help flood deer to that area and you can kind of set it up for a predominant wind in our, a pre-set stand location. Um, what, what's the best way to fence that off, Nick? Just um, using he, the dual string lines? So they- yeah, so the way we've, and we've done it up at camp that's been really effective um, is basically two rows of uh, fencing, basically um, – like two strings or two ropes or however you want to do it. Um, one at about like chest height and another one just below knee height. And you do that one row and then about just wide enough to get a mower through. So about four or five foot in, you do another of the same size or same fashion. And for whatever reason, it messes with a deer's depth perception. And even though it's only, you know, five foot high, the deer believe that they can't jump it. Um, obviously it's not a, hundred percent fail safe but um we saw it really effective Very up at camp effective. yeah we i mean we fenced off a lot of uh, it was actually sweet corn that we planted it wasn't actually really intended for the deer um and it's just an inexpensive way to yeah it's i mean it it, yeah if you want to build it 20 foot tall by all means go for it but if you're <laughs> short on cash and just looking for something to try and deter them from stepping in that's an effective way to do it but um, that makes a lot of sense if you've ever watched a deer jump over a fence it's they don't step up. back three feet and jump over it and clear it by four feet. They, it's straight they, up, straight, straight down. up, and straight down. So. And it doesn't matter how high it is. It's not. There's never like a like a launch over a no, fence. It's, they get to right it to point. it. Yep. So for whatever reason, that that's two stage idea. thing. That's it, a real good idea. Um, like I said, I, I can't guarantee that it's going to keep deer out, but I know that it is effective on keeping a majority of deer out. Right. Um, well, like you said, I mean, that could be for anybody you could use to fence off an area. And I've heard uh, Jared Larson's done that on some food plots um, and has noticed uh, influx of deer coming through once it opens up late season. And, you know, this is like post rut. So the deer are done rutting around and now their focus comes back to food. And now you've got this untouched bean field. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, and it doesn't have to be beans. It could be whatever food plot you're putting in the ground, really. Right. But like you said, I just wanted to throw that out there because I talked to Owen about it. Um, but yeah, so let's get back to the uh, old reigning uh, world or state record buck on what we call it. <laughs> it's the world headquarters for White Cat Outdoors, so it was our world record um, buck we had on the farm that you were reigning for almost probably almost twenty years at least. I would say, possibly nobody really hunted it for quite a while there. Yeah, there was a few few decades. years with no entries. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but. But yeah, so I mean, give us the rundown of that buck. Um, take us back, because I, I honestly don't know if I've heard the full story on that buck, to be honest with you. That, unfortunately, was a kind of a mercy kill. I had a buck come walking in, and he he wasn't really limping, but he was just kind of slowly walking, and it was odd because it was probably about... 70 yards from me and he just decided this looked like a good spot to lay down you know it was just bedded down head up i mean he was just kind of relaxing and this was back before new york went to rifle season so it was a shotgun only and uh, i had the old remington 1100 and iron sights on that baby 
or yep. you have a scope on yep. it. No. Love it. And uh, he actually just bedded down, and I was kind of looking at him, and he was a decent little buck for back in the day. Oh, yeah. Um, and I just kept an eye on him, and he just really was really content just to, to lay there. And I figured, well, I guess he must have came for a reason. So I <laughs> put the bead on just the way he was laying it was kind of basically right at his, on his neck just kind of mm-hmm. right between his head and his shoulders i figured i just kind of centered on there and i was up in a lock on tree stand i screwed some pegs in and it was kind of a semi-permanent stand there the pegs were always left i just <laughs> removed the stand but the, yeah. the pegs kind of grew into the tree so it ended up being more permanent than <laughs> mobile but anyway so i went and uh had the tree kind of was basically a couple of trees grew up together there so i had a good rest and just squeezed one off ever so softly and he just laid his head down and the party was over i mean it was he never even flinched so. how far was he he was only about probably about 60 70 yards that's, which that's a good, good poke with, yeah, with a slug gun yeah. that's a good poke yeah um, it was <clears throat> Maybe a little luck in there, but <laughs> hey, you know what? I had luck what? and a good rest and a gentle trigger trigger finger, and that's all you all came together. But I actually uh, gave him a few minutes, and I climbed down and went up to uh, start the field dressing process. And lo and behold, a, another hunter had come sneaking through, tracking the way he came, and said he had shot and hit it, and he did. Unfortunately, the back leg was a little bit loose and rubbery. So, so he, not he really a lethal kill, though. No, he hit it in the back leg. And it well, that didn't. shot in the neck, that must have been mine. <laughs> <laughs> must have took him off his feet with that shot back there. <laughs> yeah. I put him out of his misery with that Achilles tendon shot. <laughs> hit that femoral artery, and he was done. But And that was uh, before I really knew the property all that well, and I kind of ended up dragging them out the way I came in and which was about 300 yards and it was about two foot of snow and it quite, was quite a process and later I found had I just went the other direction and kind of crossed the creek I could have come up on the road on the outside there up off a of ten haken and it would have been oh, about. Oh did you go all the way to pet it through? Yeah through the oh, back boy. of the field and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know where I was. Oh, yeah, I know where yeah. you're at. Yeah, yeah I could have just Actually, you showed the me that tree. went up to Ten Haken, and it would have been out of the woods in probably 100 yards. And then just yeah, it's drove the far. truck around and loaded it up. But, but yeah, we you actually live and learn. Yeah. Be careful. You don't want to give out too many road names. You'll have everybody That's and true. your brother up there next month. Yeah, I know. Now that we're, now that we're starting to lay down bigger bucks. Uh, but, yeah, this was a, he was a very dominant seven point, probably about. 15 inches wide every bit of that yeah which yeah. i mean like you said back in the day that was I mean, heck it was 20 years reigning champ so <laughs> um yeah and it actually had to go and take the title yeah yeah some, but you gotta dethrone them sometimes it's still hanging in in the headquarters at the cabins which that's pretty cool we actually every buck and turkey uh that's ever been harvested there Calm and, down, and, Nick. and doe uh that's ever been harvested there we've got uh hanging in the camp which i think is pretty cool um, so I, the reason I emphasize turkey and doe, uh, that's all I've got up there. I don't have a buck on the wall yet, but exactly. it's coming. What part of the doe do you have? The whole skull. Yep. <laughs> I Just did cut the skull plate Just off. Just wanted to know. <laughs> Shit, that, Just that, saying. That would, that would be good, cutting the skull plate off a doe and putting that up. But, uh, no, I did an old-fashioned European mount on that one and all left right. it in the woods behind the cabin, and next season pulled it out, and up on the wall it went. That's way know easier than the boiling process. <laughs> yeah. Did, beetles did a great job out there <laughs> and it kept the sinuses which yeah which i don't do with a with a pressure washer so yeah that pressure washer trick that's a pretty good one though just if you're yeah, doing a european mount boil it for 15 minutes or so and then pressure wash the meat right off of it it works real good for fleshing a deer hide too the pressure washer yeah you can flesh a deer hide pretty slick with one too yeah they're pretty tough i don't i wouldn't have you tried it with anything besides a deer hide? You'd probably blow it to pieces. Uh, I bet you. I never tried it with a coon, but I bet you could a coon. Or yeah, a they're pretty tough. They're pretty tough. 
I wouldn't try it with a muskrat. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> kind of like flying everywhere. <laughs> you really don't even have to flesh those hardly after you skin no. them. They're just kind of like peeling a sock off. They're mm -hmm. so thin. You all set over there now? Nick? Yep, we're all good. You were uh, looking a little parched. Yeah, I was getting very thirsty. Um, and Glad you, you're back on track. Yeah, you don't want to be thirsty on the podcast. Now, when you're talking for that extended period of time, you gotta you got to keep the pipes wet. Hydrate, for exactly. sure. Exactly. And what better way to hydrate than with Pennsylvania's own Yingling? It's America's exactly. oldest brewery. Yeah. Right out of Pottsville, PA. Good stuff. Not sponsored, but good stuff. <laughs> um, so I do want to get into, you know, we – like obviously we just covered the buck up at the headquarters and stuff. Um, but maybe go back to one of your earlier memories. Yeah. Um, I think talking to my dad with, um, hunting with your dad. Cause I know grandpa's was a big time hunter, hunted all over. But right. Just to interrupt real quick, <laughs> just right quick <laughs> before this is a great idea. So I just wanted to get it out there so everybody can hear it. After this, I think our dad should each share their first buck story. You know what? That's, yeah, let's do that first. I actually really like that idea before we get into, like, just that. So, I guess uh, Dad just told a buck story, so let's uh, Uncle Frank give his first buck story. Oh, boy. Can you remember <laughs> that long ago? <laughs> I think so. Let me have another sip of Jim Beam. It'll might <laughs> Just don't do that typical, like, older person. Like, <laughs> it was 19... 70 no no because genie had the <laughs> the blue sedan and <laughs> i'm not that old yet <laughs> mike no mike got the root canal that year so it couldn't have been yeah <laughs> no well i i was fortunate enough uh to kill a deer my first year that i could legally hunt i was 12 years old and my dad wasn't a big hunter he did hunt a little bit you know enough to to introduce the kids to it but at that point we were kind of on our own but uh when i was 12 years old here in pennsylvania the big thing was to you know get out of erie county here and head to the mountains you know get to the big woods and you know where all the traditional whitetail hunting was done and the hunting camps were all at and and that was all i wanted to do was you know begging my dad take me to the mountains take me to the mountains was there a reason where the deer numbers better there than yeah in everybody on facebook numbers. was talking all about, about deer, deer numbers. numbers yeah all facebook right. and, was and big. it wasn't that there was a quality deer to be found i mean if uh, if it was a six point with a 10 inch spread that was something special that was winning the buck that, pool. that was winning buck, buck pulls <laughs> you know it was just the way pennsylvania was it was you know if it's brown it's down you shot it it had a horn on its head it didn't matter and uh but we didn't have a place to go to the mountains so we had to hunt you know, close to home here in, in McCain. And uh, we didn't have a lot of deer to chase, but when we did have deer, we had, you know, nice size body deer because it was all farmland and stuff. And But uh, like I said, at 12, you know, you want to go where you hear your buddies going. And, you know, we had the first day of deer season off from school. That was vacation. So, you know. So I, heard, I heard rumors that it, that hadn't been quite the case um, when you were in school yet from my mom and there used to be fake fights to get off for school. Is that, is that, a, is that a tall tale or is that, there, there is that was a anything, little truth? Anything to get out of school and go hunting was a possibility to be, I don't know. Have, it might have not have been happen. for first day, but I had heard some stories when I was younger about fake fights, not even just yeah. you guys, but other guys hunting and stuff to get out of school yeah. for a few days of hunting. Yeah. We, we were pretty lucky. My, my dad always, he was pretty liberal about letting us take time off to hunt. It was to gotcha. him, that was at least you were taking time to go do something. You weren't getting in trouble. You were yeah. out there doing something in the woods. But so we hunted the first day and uh, didn't have any luck. I hunted the second day, didn't have any luck. Had to go back to school because I took, well, an extra day off. And uh, get back to school on Wednesday. And, you know, everybody's talking about all the deer they saw in the mountains. You know, my one buddy saw 125 deer. Another one saw 75 deer. And... You know, and half of them shot bucks, and they were all spikes and four corns and three points and stuff like that. And you know, I knew the first Saturday was coming up, and I'm begging my dad again, "We got to go to the big woods. We got to go." My dad's like, "There's deer around here. You can shoot one around here." Well, we didn't get to go to the big woods like everybody else was doing, so I was starting to feel like eh, I don't have a chance of shooting a deer, you know. But my dad got with another one of his buddies. This guy's name was Bob Lasky. And uh, we went hunting with him in McCain, and uh, we were over off of West Road. Not that that's important. 
But I was carrying an old 1873 Springfield 4570 that was handed down from my great grandfather through the family. It's what quite... power scope did you have on that? <laughs> <laughs> it was a red dot, actually, Tom. <laughs> quite, quite the gun for a twelve-year-old. And, and the guns, this gun's still around. I mean, my son's used it a couple I think... times. I don't think he shot a deer with it yet. I've but... missed a couple. Yeah, I was going to say, it. I was, I wasn't going to, I was going to bring it up. I'll just be yeah. honest. We've got, we've got an empty casing at the cabin. Yeah, uh, four hundred and five for... grain slug. It moves about. 1400 feet a second we almost always, as fast as today's bows right yeah we, we always laughed and we always said if the deer was watching he'd just duck the bullet as it went by you know but but it was a it was pretty a pretty accurate rifle actually for what mm-hmm. it was you know it was in good shape so we went hunting with this friend of my dad's and they put me on stand you know at the edge of a wood line overlooking a field alongside some corn and they went and did a little loop through the woods you know, to try to push something to me because I'm the kid, you know, and I'm sitting there and I wasn't sitting there 15 minutes. And from the opposite direction that my dad and his buddy went to push deer to me, from behind me came out this, what was in our world then, a big buck. I mean, a big buck, you know, and it 60, 70 yards off my left hand shoulder and it just kind of loped across the field out in front of me and I pulled up and took a shot at it and missed it as clean as could be you know and it ran into the woods where my dad and his friend were at and i'm sitting there i was just i knew i missed i mean i knew i wasn't even close you know and it's a single shot trapdoor gun so by the time i got another round in it the deer was gone you know and i'm just kicking myself now i'm really feeling how bad big was it it, 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 it was i mean that de- well, I know exactly how big it was because I'm going to kill this deer in a minute. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we'll just I'll, leave it a big I'll, buck for I'll now. I'll tell you, th- at this point, it was the biggest deer I'd ever seen in my life. You know, in the woods. You know, so I'm sitting there and I'm really just down on myself. You know, I couldn't believe I you know, my one chance. And I mean, I remember thinking, man, my one chance at a at a deer, and it was a great deer, and this and that. You know, and I blew it and I screwed it all up. And I mean, this is a 12 year old beating himself up. You know. And it wasn't 20 minutes later, he said, that deer ran into the woods where my dad and, and Bob were at, and he come walking back out, and he was walking down the edge of the cornfield that was off to my right at this point, and he was about 150 yards away, coming up, just walking. And I looked at him, and I knew it was the same deer. So I pulled back the hammer on that old trap door and i'm like man that's a long shot for this gun i'm gonna have to hold up a little bit and i knew i mean i shot the gun a lot even as a little kid i shot quite a bit with it held up just you know just above his back line a little bit touched off or squeezed off around and as soon as i shot that deer straightened out like an arrow and bolted and i knew i hit him i was excited i was like whoo man i just got one well he ran up the cornfield about 30 yards and dove into the cornfield and i was hot on his tail <laughs> <laughs> he's already halfway better not give him a minute just go right there after. was no giving him time to go lay down and die it was i was off and running never bothered to reload that gun or nothing i was moving as fast as he was with everything i had and I got up to where I saw him go and dive into the cornfield, and uh, there was blood everywhere. You know, I had no idea where I hit him. I just knew I hit him, and when I saw the blood, I was like, oh, I got him good. So I start following him, and I didn't follow him for 50, 70 yards into the corn. And there he was, all piled up. And I'm looking at him, I'm all excited, and I picked up the head, and I'm looking at the horns and i'm counting the points i'm like one two three four five six seven eight that nine (laughs) i can make one out of that that's ten that one could probably even be eleven i can hang a ring on it that's eleven you know that was i don't know 16 inches wide you know which like i said for pennsylvania back then was just that just didn't happen very often no it didn't you know, so now I'm as excited as I am. It only took now about another minute to set in that I'm 12 years old. There's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> so I pull out my knife, you know, and I'm trying to reposition the deer, and I look up in the, out of the corn every now and then, hoping to God that my dad and Bob would show up because I don't know what I'm about to do. And, uh, 
And I start, oh, I was just getting started. You know? <laughs> and I'd whittle away for a little bit. And I'd peek up and look and whittle away and peek up. And well, finally they come out. And my dad, he's looking at Bob going, where the hell did that kid go? You know, we left him over there by that tree. And now he ain't there. Heard a few gone. shots ring out. And now he's gone. <laughs> now he's gone. <laughs> Blood everywhere. Yeah, so, but at that point, you know, I'm waving and hollering. And got my hat in the air and stuff. And they come walking over. And in today's world, it was actually probably a nine point. You know, like I said, 15 inches wide, 16 inches wide. But as a 12-year-old kid, I was trying to work it for 11. But it ended up being the biggest deer shot in school that year. <laughs> so Perfect. It, uh, it got me hooked on knowing that I don't need to go to the mountains to shoot a deer. I can, if you do your due diligence, put your time in. And obviously, I was 12. I had a lot of luck involved there. But they're around. But the deer there, you get out and hunt them, spend your time. And uh, stay positive, and you'll end up with your first deer. Yeah, they say there's a big buck in every block, you know. And I think I'm that's, a tr- there's firm believer truth. of that. There's a lot of truth to that. But. So that was my first deer. Take it easy with the mic there. Yeah, well, you know, thing got in the way. So not only <laughs> that was your first deer, period. Not but just best first ever buck. since, yeah. That was my. <laughs> that was the first deer I ever shot. Yep, and it stayed the best deer I ever shot until I was probably 25 years old. You know, but uh, pretty exciting. I was pretty happy as a 12-year-old kid. Oh, that's, yeah. yeah. Bonus, that same rifle, following year, shot my second buck. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Perfect. But that's my first deer story. My 12-year-old deer story didn't go quite so well. (laughs) (laughs) However, I was lucky enough to go to the mountains. (laughs) So you were the one that he was making. (laughs) See, that's one of the guys I didn't like. (laughs) My dad and his brothers all had a a camp up in Eldred, up in the mountains, and I was fortunate enough to go. I had been going since I was probably 10, and back then there was no... um, mentor hunting so i mean we had to wait till we were 12 and uh so i would go when i was 10 and i would just sit beside the tree and you know just be with my dad and finally it got to be 12 and he took me up and there was a it was a penzoil i believe owned it back then it was a hundred thousand acres and there was a lot of old drilling rigs and oil shacks and bulldozers and all kinds of stuff up in the mountains that just looked like one day they called it quits wrapped up and left everything and uh so the old one old oil shack made a pretty good spot to sit when i was 12 I, dad would take me up there and put me in the shack and there was no mentor hunting and apparently no rules because he went off and <laughs> said i'll be back at dark <laughs> So I'm sitting there in, in the dark, and I start hearing some tin rattling and rustling around, and lo and behold, there's a black bear shacked up in the aftermath of what was kind of blown down and just a pile of scrap. In the same spot you're at? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so well, duh. A, a little and you're, you're 12 years old by yourself in the dark. Yeah, wow. and Dad you, puts me in the oil shack with a bear. You didn't do anything to make your dad mad that day, did you? <laughs> you didn't spill his beer the night before, did you? <laughs> I did not. But, so I make some noise, I guess, getting the candy bar out, and that's enough to spook the bear. Well, the bear's finally gone, so now I'm at ease a little bit more. But uh, and back then, it was, you know, buck season only. There was no, it was bucks only. So when there was some shooting, you knew pay attention because anything can happen and up there in the mountains like frank said there was there's definitely a lot of deer and a lot of people a lot of action and uh i'd probably seen 20 30 deer by you know lunchtime i think a lot of them were the same ones running back and forth they're getting scared and bumped and but getting shot at 15 yeah, times <laughs> so i'm up there and lo and behold i'm just actually right around lunchtime i kind of gazing around and see some movement and focus in a little bit and this is probably a good 150 yards away I can see and it's a couple deer I can't really make them out yet and they're working their way a little closer and uh, as they get up to about probably about 80 90 yards um, I can tell the ones one's got horns so I'm all excited now 
now I got a, a 243. I believe it. Uh, Model 7? No, I think it was. Uh, Oh, I thought it was, it was the same one I shot my first the, buck with. The Winchester? Was yeah, the it? Winchester the Model, Model 7? 7. I think it yeah, was. because okay. we shot our first bucks with the same gun. Yeah, unfortunately, we'll get into it. So this buck... <laughs> 7 or 70? 70. Yeah. Model 70? Yeah, yeah, my bad. The, Reming, the Remington's, Remington's the Model, Model 7. 7, youth model, I think. Yeah, but yeah it was the, the Model 70. Yeah. yeah. Now we're on the right track, so... <laughs> and this one's got to go Leopold three by nine on it and i got it cranked all the way up and i can see that buck in there unfortunately he's just kind of facing me and uh, i don't have a good broadside shot and i don't have a mentor to tell me what to do <laughs> <laughs> i figure and he's starting to kind of look around you kind of can tell that they aren't going to be around much longer so it was unfortunately it was a now or never so i Put it right dead center on his chest and just squeezed one off and uh he just folded up like a sack of potatoes i mean he hit the ground so fast i grabbed all my stuff and started running down to him and uh i had my gun leaned up on a tree and i pulled my backpack off and i was looking for my pocket knife and just had gotten my knife out and uh well, actually, I take that back. Before all that, I, he was kind of laying there, and I figured I better just give him one more to be safe. And did you not, text your dad to tell him you just shot one? <laughs> we, did, we did not have cell phones. So I'm starting to realize that second shot, that is exactly where I get that from because I've got plenty of stories of just one more follow-up shot if I, just in case I don't want him going anywhere. Yeah, so the buck was laying at my feet. Um, he was still, I could see him kind of snorting a little bit, breathing, but I mean, he hit the ground so hard I was sure he was just about to die at any minute, but I wasn't taking any chances. So I pulled a John Wayne, I guess. I kind of just held it down by my hip and I uh, figured I'd just give him one in the neck off the hip and that would do the seal the deal. So, and his head kind of bounced up and some dirt flew and I knew for sure this was over, so I leaned my gun up on the tree and started to get my knife out. And it was probably about 10 degrees, so my fingers were just about <laughs> numb at this point. And I'm trying to fiddle my knife out and finally get it out and uh, get everything situated. And now everything I had leaned up against the tree was probably about maybe 10 yards from the deer. It was just a the right tree that I had their limbs that I needed to lean everything up on and as I'm walking back towards this deer it decides to just jump up and take off like 90 miles an hour <laughs> ouch <laughs> and I, I didn't mean I didn't even my gun was 20 or 15 yards behind me and <laughs> by the time I got back to my gun and turned around I'd heard two three shots and he was long gone out of sight so we trailed him up for a little while for the blood but ended up never did find him from so, finding a gut uh, pile <laughs> <laughs> we uh i did actually after looking around a little harder i found a about three points left it was the my hip shot i believe i must have just shot him right in the shot his in rack, the, right in the rack. <laughs> and, so uh, you still got the trophy <laughs> I, I do i do still have about two and a half points perfect in the gun cabinet but that's that was unfortunately my 12 year old uh, first buck story. that's well, a tough lesson learned your there. first successful Success. yeah your first yeah. successful buck tag in the ear kind of thing i think that would probably have to be uh A buck up in New York. I was probably in my early 20s. Really? Yeah, I had a pretty dry spell there. Yeah, I'd say. <laughs> you just didn't take enough time off from school. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not counting spikes and three points, right? Oh, absolutely. Oh, legal deer. 
No. Legal deer during the season. <laughs> yeah. I'd have to say it was probably the uh, a buck I killed up in New York, uh, up on a, the Morrison farm. The one that gored you? Yeah. It was... Uh, well, you can't just say the buck that gored you and not give this story away. <laughs> It was uh, back when it was shotgun only in New York, and uh, I had a favorite tree stand that was they called the watering hole. There was just a big water hole in the path that kind of led down to it. It was only about 50 yards from, from a lock-on stand that was up in a tree that uh, they had hung years before me. To, and the same thing, the pegs, the tree had bark had grown around the pegs, and around the chain holding the lock on up but is that the one when you the one broke yeah it, it, that, oh. that buck gored him we're getting there <laughs> I, I was there that year. oh you were up okay yeah and i tell you what that was kind of scary you could have been hurt bad yeah so i'm up at this tree a good probably 25 feet maybe even closer to 30 because well, it was kind of down in in yeah. a in a gully and it was to get eye level even yeah it was it was bank considerably higher than it typically would be but it unfortunately it that's just the way it needed to be and even that you get up that high even a a deer that was 25 yards out you were shooting eye level with like you weren't shooting down yeah at a deer it was like it it had to be up that high or you were going to be shooting uphill so so um it was early too it was probably about before nine o'clock in the morning and uh this nice little buck just kind of strolled in solo and uh he was only i mean i bet he was 50 yard inside of 50 yards 50 max and broadside and i laid the old crosshairs on him and squeezed the trigger and he took off like a rocket and i couldn't believe that he didn't just drop so i gave him a little bit of time and i crawled you learned this time to let him lay a little bit (laughs) yeah i did let him yeah i give him about three minutes (laughs) and uh so i climbed down and uh i go to where i shot and lo and behold i could not find a single hair a drop of blood absolutely nothing i i was dumbfounded there was not, I just couldn't believe that there was any way I could have missed it because typically I'm a pretty good shot when it comes to target shooting. And, uh, I mean, I had, I just couldn't believe it. So I searched and searched and just didn't come up with anything. So I climbed back up my tree and just kind of went over and over and over in my head, you know, how that could have happened. And, it got to be about noon, and uh, I decided, you know, it just doesn't add up. There's no way I miss that deer, so I'm going to climb back down and just go a little further and see what I can find. So I unhook my safety strap and start my descent down the tree, and I get onto the first peg, and I swing around and step down to the second peg, and as I hit the peg at the actual metal peg just cracked and it was old and rusty so it just and i didn't have snapped right off i didn't have the three point (laughs) rule in effect and uh i went straight down basically like a sliding down a telephone pole but there were with barbs (laughs) there were there were multiple pegs that uh one of them actually caught me right right in the belly about I was probably about 10 foot from the ground, so I was starting to pick up some pretty good momentum at that point. <laughs> really moving. And uh, it hooked me right under the belly and just up to middle of my chest. Missed so your chin, a, though? Yeah, it was just about a 20-inch gore from my belly button to my top of my chest. And I, I would have bet money that I was going to be having to push some stuffing back in. <laughs> you, you were lucky as hell there, because that, that could have been a disaster. Yeah, it yeah, really, it really could. Um, so I hit the ground and uh, got enough nerve to lift my shirt up and realized that it wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been. Bad enough. Still but, didn't feel good. <laughs> no, 
but uh, it didn't didn't break through the the thick meat, so I was pretty pretty fortunate. But uh, so I went on my mission to find this buck, and I followed the same path. There's still no hair, no blood, no nothing, but I just kept going a little little further, and I ended up about maybe 50 yards from where I left off, and uh, he was already stiff as a board and I mean he he and it, the bullet hole was right where I hit it was just uh unfortunate that it wasn't a clean pass through and there was a slight angle down I was up above him a little bit so I well, just yeah think 50 yards you start to but it's yeah where that close. uh where that angle you know it just didn't go through he just filled up inside but he never mm-hmm. so I did end up getting him and uh, yeah, that's where the, the goring story comes in. I figured I better dress it up a little bit and <laughs> got back to camp and told him how uh, I went to field dress him and he jumped up and started swinging his head and caught me in the stomach and I lifted my shirt up and oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so you had everything for a perfect out. story. <laughs> yeah. That was a pretty nasty cut though you had. Yeah, on it was stomach. a little hey. rough. Like you said, that could have been a real disaster. That was scary. We were unsupervised that year up at camp. A lot of the uh, <laughs> camp owners yeah, and, and higher gone. members all had gone out to uh, Powder River on a big <laughs> whitetail mule deer combo hunt, so they left us left us unsupervised. It's a dangerous, <laughs> dangerous thing. Is that the year you went on the trail cam check-in excursion through the gully with Uncle John's van? We did. He had a, uh, a company cargo van that we decided we were i don't know if it started out as a bet or (laughs) if he could or couldn't make it all the way up to the top of the camp from the from the low road (laughs) via the woods (laughs) better take the company van in his rear wheel (laughs) oh you'd never want to do that with your own vehicle (laughs) of course well he did own the company so yeah it's kind of his vehicle (laughs) We don't like to talk uh, about that because they're still a little salty over that whole ordeal. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you expect when you leave them all unsupervised? Nick, what are you doing over there? I, I'm just, I'm ready for a smoke break. It honestly. has been a few weeks since we had a smoke yeah, break. Yeah, I, I was, I was trying to quit. Um, but, been jonesing. Yeah, I've been jonesing for a smoke break. Um, so and we this got, week, we, do we have something good, something special? Oh, real good. Um, and another spoiler alert, didn't tell my dad about this one either, Um Nick just never likes to tell yeah. anybody anything. He just so, starts throwing it in. Yeah, well, we've been starting to, we've been talking all these buck stories, um, and my dad's got a killer recipe that we have. It's been an evolution. Um, started out as you know jalapeno poppers that we've done our own way, and my dad has elevated it um, to a point now where we were using deer steaks um, with the jalapeno poppers. Um, you know, like the uh, basically it's a little appetizer with you know like deer steak jalapeno cream cheese a little bit of bacon and it's a great hit at any party right, we're but, hungry let's let's yeah. get to so it so <laughs> i'll i want to turn it over to my dad here to give us a little rundown on how this like kind of just tell us how you do it because it's like i said it's a party favorite that goes real quick is, is this even a secret recipe you're allowed to give out you can leave what? out the the secret <laughs> ingredients but <laughs> i think if it's your recipe you get you have the discretion whether or not you want to give it away yeah i think Nick's got two separate recipes that he's kind of just turned into one story here. So I'm not sure what direction he really well, wanted to go. But there's the jalapeno the, poppers, you, and yeah. then there's the the jalapeno with the cream cheese, and a the, slice of cheese, deer steak wrapped yeah, in bacon. Yeah, that's the one yeah. I want. Okay. Yeah. The jalapeno poppers, That's we have our own recipe for that. We're not giving that away. If it's got a jalapeno, <laughs> it's called a jalapeno popper. Yeah, that's kind of what I was feeling. But All yeah, right. Your, so, your deer steak with the jalapeno and the cheese. It's just a, a fresh, homegrown jalapeno cut in half, de-seeded. And, leave uh, a few seeds if you like some bite. If you like a little extra heat, you can leave a few in there. They claim that, that it makes it hotter. I don't buy it. I definitely buy it. <laughs> well, but I've had some that I swear were cleaned out that rock your world. So, yeah, jal- the nice thing about jalapenos is they do vary in intensity drastically. 
How is that the nice thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, it depends on who you are. <laughs> Life's always a surprise. Yeah, it's a nice little surprise. Yeah, Forrest Gump said, Tom, so, you never know what you're going to get. So, yeah, you just you cut that jalapeno right in half, de-seed it, clean it out the best you want. And basically, you just take a, uh, a back strap works probably the best. A nice little... Premier cuts, yeah. Chunk, you know, just a little one-by-one, one, kind of a bite size morsel of back strap. And then we've actually used different cheeses i mean you can use typically you use kind of a hot, hot pepper cheese and you just cut that into a cube kind of to match about the same size as the uh steak and then uh just a short piece of bacon and you just wrap wrap the bacon around the whole works to kind of hold that cheese and meat into the half a jalapeno and poke a toothpick through it throw it on the grill and as soon as the bacon's done the whole thing's ready to go. Yeah, I tell you what, they are dynamite. They definitely are. I could eat me a whole mess of them things. So how many did you bring with you today? Uh, actually, didn't bring any. Uh, the, the smoke the, breaks are for you to try at home, yeah. not for well, us. Well, he's to... at his house, so that but, doesn't work yeah, here. I'm at home. <laughs> it turns out, Look around I don't know, you. <laughs> it turns out, the studio's at Uncle Frank's house. So... So we like to kick him out of his house once a week. Well, <laughs> drink his we beer <laughs> and then leave. It's it's a great and system. And the whiskey, we, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. The whiskey does get touched, you know. It's a but really good system we have. It's a good on. business model, really, for anybody that's interested. We'll lay it out for you. But yeah. thank you for that smoke break, and I sprung that on you. But I was sitting here thinking of all this venison and how we haven't done this smoke break in a while, um, and. Felt like that was the perfect one to bring it back because that's yeah, that's they, a delicious recipe. They are recipe. really, really good. Um, yeah, and like you said, if you get the seeds out, pretty safe that they're going to be a mild treat um, that anybody can enjoy. So. And and if if you're really not into the the heat, you can cook it just a little bit longer. The longer you do cook them, you can cook, cook the heat. Cook out. the heat right unless out of it. So you yeah. can even use smoke. like a if you bring sweet smoke, banana pepper or something if you don't like absolutely. heat. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But yeah, if you like that little bite the jalapeno has that's definitely the way to go but if you don't like hot stuff you could use a get sweet cr- banana pepper with cheddar cheese and smoked gouda beer really you get crazy with it yeah <laughs> any variation but yeah the way we like to do it's with the jalapeno some pepper cheese and oh man that's the stuff <laughs> thanks tom yeah you get bet it. yeah i'm hungry <laughs> let's eat no, i wish um before we get too far, um, I'm getting thirsty over here. Smoke breaks get the does that to you. All that talking. Yeah. Um, before we get too far, um, I do want to bring up that uh, my dad, Frank's dad, um, a few years back, um, were able to book a hunt together up in Alaska, and I thought that would be a cool story to kind of because I don't think we've ever talked about that hunt in general. I mean, Uncle Frank's been to Alaska a lot of times. Um, but my dad's never been up there, so just maybe give a rundown of that whole experience. I, to me, it was a, it was a great story with everything you guys got to do up there. That was a little sore for me because it was my worst year of moose hunting ever. We don't, I don't think we ever even heard of moose the whole time. You know, all the years I've been going up there, and I mean, I can sit and tell moose hunting stories till, you know, you're sick of listening to them. And I don't think we were able to get a moose to even answer us that whole time. No, we, we, see, we had some unfortunate we seen a few warm from weather, the, didn't you? From the plane, we had some foul yeah. weather that didn't play in our favor. So yeah, so it turned. So let's talk about your fishing trip to Alaska. It was more of a fishing trip because I failed terribly in the moose calling <laughs> tactics at that year. I just so. I've never been to Alaska, so like any story about Alaska, just like. Yeah fascinates me because like it's just you know the last frontier if you will i mean don't get me wrong we had i had i had fun i mean absolutely you know we got to see cool country and we did some great fishing and stuff and i think we even saw a couple bears didn't we we've seen some bears while you were Uh, fishing i heard yeah yeah one snuck up on me while i was fishing (laughs) (laughs) what do you got on that stringer over there (laughs) (laughs) and it belongs to him at that point (laughs) But uh, yeah, it was it was just a skinny year for moose for me. I couldn't I couldn't get the job done to save my life. There were there were a couple moose taken um, nearby. Yeah, camp. we helped yeah. Uh, we helped Jimmy Petla Jimmy pack one took out. One. Didn't? Yep. Um, and there were a few a little further up the river there, not yep. not too far, but yeah. But unfortunately, uh, like I said, the moose hunting was pretty rough. But like I said, we we had some real good fishing. Yeah, fishing. We seen we seen a little bit of everything though. We did see. 
few brown bear. Um, seems to actually got to see some caribou. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Wolverine. Ron, Ron Kohler shot a Wolverine. What's yeah. the uh, scoop on caribou hunting in Alaska currently? Is it, There's been some – a lot. I guess it's a lot's changed in the recent years with it, hasn't it? Well, the problem with that state is it's so big, and there's so many different management units. So, Are they bigger than the management units in our area, or are they the same size, and that's why there's so many? Oh, God, no. They're, they're so much. I mean, they got management units up there that are the size of Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I'm just curious. Like, I, like you said, yeah, I've never so, looked into no, it. So. So, what, what you, so when we talk about the caribou changing, you know, I, I'm usually referring to the areas that I'm used to going yeah, to. Yeah, you're familiar with. And, you know, we were up the New Shigak River drainage, and that was typically the Mulchatna herd of caribou. And at one time, it was the premier herd to hunt back 80s, 90s, into the 2000s. But as the 2000s rolled in, it it started crashing fast. And uh, so now that area is closed to non-residents. Is that due to overhunting, you think, Uh, or just times change? A a little bit of everything. I mean, the hunting practices were poor, uh, but... That herd had gotten so huge, I mean, it was literally eating itself out of house and home. Uh, okay. The predators in the area, meaning the wolves, the bears, and the people, you know, those numbers all popped. And so it, typically with, with anything in nature, rarely is it one thing that leads to the demise or the downfall uh, to what happens to any group of animals, you know. And it was it was just a perfect storm. The herd got huge. The, they, you know, the food wasn't coming back fast enough to accommodate them. The large number allowed for an increase in bear and wolves. Uh, it brought more people in hunting, and it just it all culminated in, you know, a crash in the herd. And and now it's starting to come back. I mean, last year when Whitey was up there with yeah, us, yeah, we saw quite a few on the river. You know, we were starting to see nice looking bulls again. When you guys were up there, you and Uncle Todd. That was was that you could still hunt caribou when you guys were up there because that was no, no, probably I don't no think so. we were we were done hunting caribou with non residents at that point yeah, yeah. it was resident yeah. only so but uh, so and it, but there's parts of Alaska that still have great caribou herds and you know, okay so you're just it, we're the, just yeah your the, area okay the area that we typically have hunted in. Um, yeah, I forget that Alaska is like half the size of the U.S. Correct. Like, <laughs> like I said, you can cut it in half, and Texas would become the third largest state. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but that's where we're at with that caribou herd, and it's getting better. It's coming back again. And, yeah, I uh, think conservation has. Um, you always got to put the something quality, back. Yeah, the quality of conservation, are. I feel like, has increased immensely over yeah. the last twenty years, or over throughout the country, I believe. Well, um, I mean, just in general, conservation. I mean. If you look back over the past hundred years of hunting in the U.S., you know we've seen huge improvements in duck hunting, turkey hunting, deer hunting. You know there were times where all that stuff had been hunted into submission. And there was a closed season in <clears throat> Pennsylvania for whitetail at one point, wasn't there? Like a year that they... years ago, I mean, long before my time. Oh, okay, before because yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah. I've read about like to a point mm-hmm. where like populations in pennsylvania had gotten so low where they actually closed the season well, and they imported deer from michigan into pennsylvania to help replenish the wow. deer stocks at one time so yeah i mean and and the biggest part of those conservation efforts have been made by hunters you know the hunters have made some of the mistakes but they've also been the biggest proponent to we've evolved to, yeah. to repairing it the, the the things that have happened so that everybody can get out there and still enjoy it so uh, downfall to all that is probably uh, we tend to be more reactive than proactive. You know, the game commission, the, the powers that be, all of us. Yeah, they don't start fixing the problem, problem until, until it's, it's a problem. Broke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and that, like I said, it's easy to sit here and be an armchair quarterback and, and yeah. look back and say, well, if we would have done this 20 years ago, we wouldn't have this problem. Well, yeah, you don't any, see it. Any genius can do that. You know, it's it's, it's looking into the future and, and yeah. uh, solving problems before they become problems, so. But, no, the caribou herd in our area is starting to come back. I don't know that that's going to mean hunting for non-residents anytime soon. But uh, we saw... Looking up. more. <laughs> yes, it was looking better for, you know, the past couple of years. So, But, yeah, let your dad talk a little bit about how he felt about that, that whole trip to Alaska. The guide was terrible. Served, it was all bad. <laughs> We've established yeah, that. One out of five stars <laughs> would not recommend <laughs> 
No, it was a, it was a phenomenal uh, experience just being up in Alaska. I mean, you, I don't know, wherever you go in the woods and you think, my God, nobody's ever been here before. But up there you could actually kind of get that feeling. And, and being on the food chain up there is kind of a eerie feeling too. I mean, you hey, go you're up, no longer <laughs> the top. Yeah, you, I don't think you are the top up there. But we ended up flying all the way across country there. We ended up leaving uh, Seattle maybe to yep. get up into Anchorage. And then we got a flight over to uh, Dillingham, which was an interesting little airport. <laughs> yeah, more very a, more interesting. Of a, oh, yeah, it was still pretty little then, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Just a kind of a steel shed, basically, but that was the actual airport. But we we got a, where do you a, check your bags in? Is there, you, is there a bag return? Much, you're your own your own bag checker. <laughs> yeah, you're still allowed to have knives and stuff on those planes <laughs> and guns. <laughs> I believe it was the otter. Yeah, yes, it was an otter, otter and a beaver. Yep, we flew in on an otter. Yeah, you pack all your stuff up there, and I think we had just a few extra pounds than recommended because he. <laughs> He had to bounce it up and down a couple times off the water to get us up over the the, the hills <laughs> on our way to camp. And That's like one of the things that like a lot of people don't talk about when they're going to Alaska. You know, they talk about their hunt and you know the animals they saw. But one of the more fun things is the traveling aspect up there because you do see things in those airports, those tiny little airports and those planes that you would never see anywhere else. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, we basically were responsible for loading the plane with our gear. And then uh, as we were finishing up, starting to get in, the pilot was already working on the controls and getting ready for takeoff. So he says, you know, make sure that back door's latched. And I've never latched a otter back door in my life. So <laughs> not a pilot. Wait, you're telling I'm me just... they didn't teach you that in high school? <laughs> they did not. But... Uh, so basically, it's just give it the old shake. Say that's not going anywhere. <laughs> exactly. It, pretty user friendly, but just the fact that make sure the tape's not peeling back. <laughs> yeah, it's Baylor twine. Make sure you get three full wraps on that loose screw. <laughs> yes. Yeah, pull it tight and twist the knob and hope she stays. <laughs> Slap it once. That's not going anywhere. Ready to go. Oh so, yeah. Then he takes off for blue skies and. We're just not getting any higher, and he's going faster and faster, and the tree line's approaching, and so he does. It's kind of like skipping a rock. He just kind of gets a little momentum going and bouncing off the water, and sure enough, we just barely cleared the treetops, and up in the sky we went. And un unbelievable scenery, though, to, to to look down and just to see all the the drainage rivers that just S curve like a big giant snake. You know, just like Frank said, we were you could go north south east or west and still be on the same river going the same direction as far like upstream but so wow. sometimes compasses you know you you question whether they're accurate or not but <laughs> really trust them up there <laughs> yeah <laughs> but so we ended up uh getting dropped off what 120 miles north of Dillingham somewhere? Yeah, about that. Just outside of Dillingham, yep. that's yeah. about right. <laughs> Just up there, a short little flight, and found a nice little river bank to unload all our gear. And so we pulled the plane up with some rope and kind of tied it off as we unloaded all our equipment onto this river bank. And, I mean, there's absolutely nothing around. And uh, the plane... Gets all our stuff unloaded and then takes off. <laughs> <laughs> You're on your own. There you are. <laughs> now what? So, well, Frank and his buddies, they had had uh, some friends that were going to bring some boats by sooner or later. Take it, us up. At some point, yeah. there, there may be boats. <laughs> there, there, there was one little interesting part of that flight in, and I don't know if you were ever aware of it or not, but our pilot, it was his first time up into that part of the Nushagak River drainage. He'd never been up there. And I, yeah, it's coming back to me because I remember the plane going like sideways so he could get a different trying look to, at trying what to was. Fly, well, he didn't know where he was going. And I don't fly well, so I tend to like get in the plane and try to sleep because I, I get motion sick real easy. 
Well, as we got up there, Charlie, the pilot, kind of nudges me, and he's like, hey, I think we're close. You want to take a peek and see if anything looks familiar to you? <laughs> Well, that is which, a very which brought about a couple feeling. of them circles and looking around <laughs> to try to like reorient the pulling ex- two G's into yeah. the circle. <laughs> exactly where we were at on the river to make sure we were hitting the right landing spot so we wouldn't be like twenty miles from the camp we were supposed to be. It was only a few minutes in the plane. I don't, I don't see what the problem is. <laughs> but it did all work out just fine. That's but, funny. Yeah, it, it did lead to a couple extra circles trying to make sure we were in the right spot and noticing landmarks and stuff like that so but but we got off the plane all right in one piece we grabbed our fishing poles and actually i think might have caught my first grayling while we were waiting for the boats to come Mm -hmm. yep i don't think we had to wait too long for no for paul to show up did Paul showed up with a boat and one in tow and Mm mm-hmm we had to find one of your caches and yeah, pull start. some motors out. And the work or began. We might have brought a motor. We brought a, we brought one motor in with us. There was one up there, and uh, but yeah, the work began at that point. So get camp set up, cut some wood to hold us over for the week or three weeks. <laughs> you know, probably three weeks. <laughs> yeah. No, we were only in for about two weeks. It was eleven days in both. Oh, that's season. A, yeah, you were gone three weeks, but yeah, you know, we it takes a little couple, time couple days on both ends, and yeah, a little extra time coming out. Like you said, a lot, flying in Alaska is not exactly a like a a set thing where this is the day you fly out at this time. Oh, no, when I you know this year, I, the one airport you land in Anchorage at you know the Anchorage International Airport, then you go to the smaller airport that flies you to you know all the native villages. The bush. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, you your ticket might say, you know, yeah, I'm supposed to fly on this plane. It's supposed to leave at 10 o'clock. And you get there. If they don't have enough people to make it worthwhile to fly that plane, they're just not going to fly the plane. It doesn't matter if you have a ticket or not. They're like, yeah, no, we're not going. <laughs> yeah, that plane that was make supposed to leave at 10, yeah, we were actually pretty much full at 8, so we just said send it. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that exact scenario happens on a regular basis. Wow. I, yep. So you have to add a few days for, for you cushion. Be, you better be flexible. You better be flexible. There's no, I need to get back to work. And they're like, oh, didn't didn't understand that. Sorry, sir, just hop on. We'll get you out there. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We landed in Dillingham one year, and we actually got to take uh, Alaskan Airlines jet into into Dillingham, you know, 737. And I was like, holy cow, boy, we, we lucked out. You know, we're going to get there and, where are Short we going to land this thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, the runway was big enough. It was the, the terminal just didn't accept anything. We're still walking across the tarmac. But uh, but we got there, and everybody's all excited. You know, boy, we flew in on the jet, and da 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 Well, even though it's a 737, it was only holding about 40 people because they had blocked off the back of the plane to carry luggage and cargo and stuff like that that needed to come into Dillingham. While we were flying, we hit some turbulent air, and it shifted some of that cargo and pushed it up against the doorway that would typically let you into there to offload luggage. So the 40 or so people that were on the plane, we get off, we walk to the tarmac, and we're all waiting for our luggage to show up, and 20 minutes goes by, half hour, and it never takes that long because it's like dump it off the plane, kick it out in the garage, and they're route through it. Well, somehow, they couldn't get through the door they wanted to because the <laughs> luggage had pushed up against it. You couldn't open it, yeah. There's other hatches to get into that. So, so you'd think they'd to, plan that there, to open well, the door out. Well, well, there, well, there are other ways into the cargo area. Nobody had the keys to get into this lock space. <laughs> That plane never lands here. Why would we need to get into it? <laughs> Left in the casuals. <laughs> so, long story short, the only way to get everybody's luggage was to fly the plane back to Anchorage to get into the cargo hold and then fly it back to Dillingham. So what, did they wait until the plane was halfway back before they told you guys that this was the plan? Oh, no, it was still, they were still trying to figure out how they were going to get to it. Oh, okay. You know, I, I thought that this like, and, hour later, and you guys was, like, where's there, there, there was one young lady there who had flown to Dillingham for some medical seminar, which I can't imagine what it could have been. I mean, if it'd be like 
flying into McCain of population six and holding a medical seminar there for something. And she's just losing her mind because, you know, her luggage is on that plane and she needs it to go to this seminar, yada, yada, yada. And she, I remember her looking at the one lady behind the terminal and go, well, just tell me how to get to a Walmart. And I'll go get whatever I need. And everybody around her just started howling. I mean, she clearly had never been to Dillingham before because it's a fishing town of, you know, 1,500 people in the off season, 3,000 when there's fishermen there. There ain't no such thing as Walmart. (laughs) So it took us 24 hours to get our luggage. So her hopes and wishes didn't unlock the plane, is that what you're saying? No. She (laughs) sat there and wished and prayed all she wanted. She wasn't getting on that getting her luggage off that plane or going to walmart for that matter <laughs> yeah, they did not put a walmart in for this for this you're telling me they had a medical seminar up there and they didn't put a walmart in just in case can you believe it <laughs> that, that's crazy so, but let's get back to fishing <laughs> so yeah we run through you know the fish you guys were at, or not really targeting but i mean you guys caught a variety of species yeah we had some time because we got we got up there before there was there was actually a lot going on. We had some guys that were going to do some bear hunting and some moose hunting, and we were up there before even the seasons opened. So we had some camp to set up and some scouting to do and and some time to kill. So we ended up doing a little fishing, and it was really unique for me because I'd really never fished for you know salmon like that, and especially up in Alaska where the you know we were at the right time of the season where they. Um, silver salmon had turned bright red and with a big green head and it was pretty neat and we ended up catching a lot of silver salmon some um, what were the grayling some char dolly vardens dolly vardens were really quite a few really dolly neat they were, I yeah, dolly are dolly vardens that's <clears throat> quite a few northern pikes yeah we did get into some pikes yeah, we did hit some of the sloughs for some pike fishing, didn't we? Yep, we sure yep. did. Mm-hmm. And they always told you, told me how bony they were and not good eating. And I don't know if it was because you didn't have a whole lot to eat for a day or two, but some of that pike was the best best eating. That's one of my favorite eating. Actually, yeah, Frank said the same thing. Pike's one of his favorites. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a nice white flaky meat, you know. I, mean, I, I don't, I can't say I've ever eaten pike. Um, so I can't speak on it's it. It's definitely but. worth it. The old red and white K.O. Wobbler does the trick up there. Well, you're just going to give all their secrets away. Why don't you give them lots and longs, too? <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee yeah. most of our listeners are never going to be fishing that part of the Nushagak. Well, if you if tell they, them exactly if you where, are, though, they you, are now. You definitely, <laughs> you definitely want a red and white K.O. Wobbler. You do have to cut, cut one hook off. You've got to yeah. cut two off. You're only allowed one. Yep. Unless unless you're the fish warden. I've caught the one fish warden up there, the game warden. I uh-huh. caught him fishing with treble hooks one time. Well, that that's for uh, – <laughs> they're collecting data. It's no longer fishing. Yeah, it was him and his girlfriend going up for the weekend at his camp. <laughs> <laughs> and all, all, every rod in his boat had treble hooks on it. I was like, how you doing there? <laughs> It helped so. establish our relationship, though. Yeah, I'm sure it did. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> A little more lenient on you. Yeah. So. But no. We actually, one fishing story wasn't even us fishing. It happened to be a, a bald eagle come down through one time, and he must have caught himself a silver salmon. And traditionally, they kind of, you'll see them where the fish will be parallel to his body i guess i don't know how to describe it but they'll yeah. grab it you know by so the his back. nose is in line with his nose no right? or so the other perpendicular way. perpendicular okay. yeah perpendicular they're they're the eagle's nose is flying north and the fish is heading east heading, and west you bet gotcha but this particular one must have tried to get away and he ended up <laughs> scooping them by they're the side they were, they were both <laughs> nose north. nose was both facing the same direction and Kind of like he was just taking them for a little tour. <laughs> Let me show you this cool spot up here on the river. You'll love it. <laughs> no, you really do see some neat stuff. We've seen a lot of um, otters kind of come off the banks. Our camp was right on the on the river, so we've seen quite a few otters cruising around. Now, so I've heard Uncle Frank and Frankie talk um, certain 
places they've hunted where they already have like camp established if you will um were you guys like totally in the bush like there was there any preset stuff up there like you guys have had like almost like sheds that you box up stuff for following seasons yeah we'll Um, take like what we did like doing our moose camps we'll have like wooden floors that we just build out of two by fours and put the tents on top of that and then when we're done for the season we'll tear the tents down and then we'll just stand those floors up and make it you know like a shed to put all the tents and everything in so you don't have to haul you know 500 pounds of stuff back down river you know every and then back up again next year so just as much as you can leave up the river that's what we yeah. try to do so is that the case where you guys were out were you guys out like totally in the bush not quite the same we actually i'm not sure um how they prepared or planned it but i know uh, i was just kind of along for the ride so yeah. i didn't get into the details of uh exactly where we were staying but when we we ended up getting getting our boats and frank did have a like what frankie was describing like a a cache that's kind of a, a basically a little shed that that's built up and that kind of holds all the stuff that you know you don't need to take yeah back. just stuff like frying pans stove, and different yeah. different things for for setting up their camps but I don't remember Frank could probably chime in here in a little bit and explain he was parched he's he's why we didn't get getting get some Gatorade those, in his system one of those here. camps I don't know if some somebody else that was hunting up there got there before Could have us been, or uh, well maybe uh, like i'm just speculating here um you guys didn't go through an outfitter um that trip so i would no, imagine it was that all self-guided because frank and his buddy ron and al had had guided up there so they were going to take kind so of a might... year off of guiding and kind of just go up and do some hunting so they were just talking about how the the camp arrangements are set up where you come in and end up at a at a designated area but we really didn't have that designated area because we ended up just pitching tents on the river bank. Yeah, the uh, where our cache of stuff was at was at a campsite that uh, a friend of ours had. He was an outfitter, and uh, there was actually there was four guys in our group. There was, you know, Todd here, myself, a gentleman from Cleveland, Ohio, named Al Smith, and another guy from uh, Pennsylvania, Ron Kohler, and. Uh, so we kind of went to that base camp that this friend of ours had, and we kind of got our stuff. And we were originally going to stay right there, was our original plan. Well, the outfitter, you know, a friend of ours, needed the camp to take care of some clients that he had. So we just kind of shot down river a mile and popped everything up on a on a gravel bar, you know. Gotcha. So uh, it made a little more work for us, a little inconvenient for us, but. Is it, what it is, yeah. Well, it really didn't. Sounds change. like if that's the, it, didn't, it didn't change our ability to hunt. Yeah, it I mean, sounds like were, if that's the biggest issue you ran into on your way to Alaska, it sounds like a pretty good trip. Yeah, there. everything. But that's made one up thing about well. Alaska. Pretty much everything is an inconvenience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you better be flexible. So, but uh, but yeah, we like uh, you were talking. We have little wooden boxes, you know, caches that we will store stuff, and you have to have permits for those caches. Yeah, I just imagine. Yeah, and. Uh, and those permits are are secured by the registered outfitters that are up there. So, and the, you know the size of that cache is you know determined by the permit that you have and and what you keep in that cache. You know, those are all details that go into that permitting process. So, but it saves you a lot of time and effort when you're trying to set camps up if you can leave cots and tents and pads and you know the stuff that's going to stay there year in and year out if you can leave that kind of stuff yeah. in the field you can save yourself a lot of shipping costs so but yeah we had to tear that thing apart and uh i think we actually we set paul's camp up for him too and then went down and set ours up so, right yeah we so we got like double whammy we got to build two camps and <laughs> how nice out, of you and hunt out of one <laughs> but uh but that's just that. Like I said, that's that's part of the experience. Up yeah, there. I was just curious on how because I, like, you guys have had different experiences depending on where you've worked with or outfitters you've worked with. I was just curious how that one played out. Yep. Like I said, it, in the end, it was all good. You know, we had a nice dry camp, dry gravel bar to stay at. You know, we had got our firewood. Everything was good, and we were still hunting the same areas that nice. we planned on hunting. Fish in the same areas. <laughs> yeah, fish more fish in the same areas. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Sounds like he's still a little sore about that. Just it myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I guess I just want to touch again on just thanking um, not only my dad and Frank's dad here, but all dads. It sounds like you're about to sign it off. Let's, oh, not not totally sorry. Okay. Well, I was gonna say before we like go out, you know, it is Father's Day. You know, we had these guys on because you know they brought us into the outdoors, and they're the reason why we do all the things that we do. So, I just want to hear like each one of your like favorite stories that you have with us. You know, like with Nick and Tom and Luke. You know, for you, Uncle Todd, and you know, like you with me. You know, because we've all spent a lot of time together in the outdoors. You know, what's like one of your favorite stories to tell when you're talking about you know hunting with your kids? That's a great... Todd, why don't yeah. you go first? Or do you need time to think? Uh, I think I already know what your story is. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin with just one favorite story because there's just well, so I can, many. I can throw I know, a bone at you and I'll, do like our first... I'm going to break the rules and give you more than just one, so... Good well, you got you got three. Yeah, I got three boys, so I got, <laughs> you got room three for stories. a couple stories. But with uh, my oldest son, Nick, my one of my favorite stories would probably be uh, when he killed his first gobbler, he was probably, I'm not even 10. sure he might, were you were 10? It was 10. 10. It was the first year that the mentor program opened up. Okay. So yeah, he was 10 years old and I actually had seen a gobbler out strutting in the field the night before. And he actually had to get up and go to school in the morning. The bus usually comes around about seven Oh five. Maybe he had to be yeah. on the school bus. And uh, but I knew that gobbler couldn't have went too far because I had seen him just before dark. So I asked Nick if he wanted to to go back there and try to get that bird, and he was he was all in. My mom did say that I had to go to school though, so like there was that confliction. Did have the time restraint. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we got back there before light, which I don't even know back then, maybe 5:30 or so. Yeah, I mean it was it was early. People and, that turkey uh, hunt understand. We let it so. let it unfold and didn't really hear a whole lot after first light so we kind of made a few soft clucks and yelps and that bird was gobbling probably a, oh maybe 150 yards away or so and uh so we just kind of let it play out a little bit more and we were pressed for time and i do get a little bit excited when i hear birds gobble so i call a little more excessively than needed so we started giving him a little more excitement our way and you could definitely hear him closing the distance pretty fast and uh like nick was yeah he was 10 we had a single shot single shot 20 gauge i think it was was the old savage 99 i think a 222 over a 20 gauge single shot with a scope I so, had one of those as a kid. Yeah, I killed, like, I've always several. wanted to get another one just yeah. because I had one when I was little. And uh, so I had Nick right, I mean, in my lap, right between my knees, and my back was on the tree, and Nick's back was on my chest. I mean, we were just real tight, and the bird, there was some grapevines or something that it kind of had to work around, and yeah, it was kind of hung up on the other side, and by the time he worked around, I mean, this bird was in our lap i mean it was like 20 yards when you you had whispered you know when he caught when he gets in front of that grapevine go ahead and give it to him yeah so and nick's got got the gun up on his knee and you know he's between my knees everything's all tight and you know, there's really no mo- movement everything was in ready to go long before that bird came into sight so he'd come around that corner and i whispered in nick's ear i said go ahead go ahead and take him when you're ready and uh the bird's coming closer and closer and mind you we didn't have decoys or anything so it wasn't like there was anything to pull him a different direction he's coming right no. to the sound yeah but i mean we can't call at this point i, I can i can start seeing his eyelashes already you know? <laughs> and i'm just wondering you know at what point he, i mean he got closer and closer and i believe after the shot we paced it off and uh so anyway he, he came in and nick finally did squeeze the trigger off and i we high fived and I asked him why he waited so long and he just was a little bit too excited. But we paced it <laughs> off and it and it ended up eleven yards. <laughs> I well, smoke. you don't want to jump a gun and shoot too soon. <laughs> yeah, I smoked him though. So yeah, he he, he I'm surprised did. his head was intact. My favorite part of that whole ordeal, I remember, because I was I was ten. It was the first thing I've ever killed, um, and we're standing over this bird. And I'm shaking like crazy. You know, I was just, the adrenaline was flowing like crazy. I remember 
not knowing what's happening. You know, I'd look at my dad and I said, dad, I'm shaking, like I'm shivering like crazy, but I'm not even cold. <laughs> like I, I had no idea what was happening. He said, that's adrenaline, buddy. Like you're, <laughs> you're excited. <laughs> like yeah. I, I, cause I've never, I've never experienced that before. It was that, that right there, I think is probably what hooked me. And I think I might've been even more excited than Nick that day. That really, Without that it, was, oh, I'm sure. it was pretty special moment, but even cooler 650 was when i killed that bird and i made it in time to get back on the bus uh, i remember like we ran back to the house pretty much and i woke my mom up told her i got a bird and she was super excited and so i made unless it unless you take a day off no i wanted pictures to are gonna to, have to be, wait till believe later. it or not i actually wanted to go to school because i wanted to tell all my buddies that you know i just killed a turkey this morning what'd you do this morning you know so i i, I was bragging like crazy all day it was like fourth grade and these kids don't even you know, I'm telling my teacher I'm shooting turkeys in the face with shotguns. And, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was, like you said, that's, it was my first time, or not first time hunting, but uh, first successful, you know, killed something with my dad. And I think that's probably what sealed the deal and kept me in the woods every season ever since. Good deal. Good deal. So we'll pass it to you now, Dad. Whoa. Whoa. We're, well, I, yeah, I, I'm on, I got three I stories. We were gonna go back and forth. Oh, uh, yeah, good cover up. <laughs> we might as well. We might as well go two. Like yeah, before we're both I here, forget, we'll go. Yeah, he might. Yeah, we'll just so, we'll do Tom. And Tom then, was next in line in the my boys. So my favorite hunting fishing story with him was probably hunting. We were uh, out at my uncle John's farm that uh, just recently actually acquired that property. This previous year so now it's tom's farm and uh but we were up hunting the coon stand which we nicknamed the coon stand because uh there was a raccoon that inhabited it pretty regularly and he would not leave when you went up in the stand he might climb up and hide out a he little didn't further bother you or anything no, he, he just, just like he just, hang out he'd be there with you it was kind of an enclosed old permanent wooden stand that had a little wood roof on it and then he would crawl out of the stand and climb up on the roof and just sit up there until he got out and then he'd come back in but he never That's bothered us cool, but, though. Yeah. he'd peek <laughs> down every once in a yeah, while he, but he'd never bother you and uh we were we were up there and how old were you tom i was 10 it was the it was my first it was actually the following the very season first after time i was legally allowed to carry a gun in the woods it was the mentor hunt mentor it was hunt opening day of rifle when i was 10 years old my first time actually yeah it was literally it was the following season after i got my turkey it was that turkey season and then the first deer season that was the first mentor deer season and pa had implemented the antler restrictions at this point but i don't i think they were it doesn't apply to youth apply yeah, to youth, youth didn't, or have, mentors. didn't have to worry about it, but there were some some definitely some decent bucks in that area and uh so I was hoping that, you know, a, a better buck would come by, but it happened to be early, and uh, a nice little three-point decides to sneak out, and I told Tom that, you know, it's just a three-point, and I think you should probably wait on it. You know, I think there's there's definitely better bucks out there, and he's like, no, nah, I think I think I want that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I figured I, it, I was trying to talk him out of it, and then I got to thinking, you know, who am I to – talk him out of his first buck you know that's not very dad like so i i said you know what if if you're happy with that one he probably cut you off mid sentence yeah if it was bang before i was even done <laughs> all right shut up dad i got this <laughs> but uh it, he uh he actually did he was probably about he wasn't too far maybe oh, he's 25 yards maybe yeah he was he, close he made a, a little 20 yard loop and when as soon as he sur- turned around i mean i could see well tom you know, thought he missed it first because yeah he, he'd never hunted before and the deer took off well yeah it didn't fall down so he he thought maybe he missed it but as soon as it turned around i could see right behind its shoulder it was bleeding pretty good already and i told tom to go ahead and rack another shell in and i think before he closed the bolt it had it had fallen down and so he, and i think he had that same same shaken experience that you you felt because he was he was shivering a little bit and it was plenty warm out (laughs) i do feel a little bit bad because i got my buck we had gutted it got the tag on it and it was i mean 20 yards from the tree stand so we left it sit there and i shot the buck it was probably 11 o'clock in the morning mind you he gutted it at this point that's this is going to play into effect here soon but me and my dad get back up in the tree stand because now it's his turn to hunt and 
about every two minutes I pull the binoculars up to. I thought you were. You said you were pulling your scope up and putting the crosshairs on him. Well, just yeah, just making sure he wasn't going anywhere after he'd been gutted. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> you, you, it's important that you understand that the buck has been gutted when he's doing. Well, I was ten years old. I'm pretty well, sure he's well, not after, going anywhere. After any hearing farther. your dad's story about being shooting his deer yeah, twice yeah. and he got up and ran away, we've got a few questions. <laughs> I, might be, I might be nervous too. So after about an hour and a half of me checking on this deer every five seconds my dad finally said okay i think he's ready to get out of the stand and <laughs> go up to the garage and start celebrating so i i did cut my dad's hunt a little bit short we were probably out of there by you know one o'clock in the afternoon but yeah, i was that, ready that to didn't get to bother me one bit that was a partying. great great day <laughs> good story that's it's hilarious <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let uncle frank take a turn and then we'll go back to my dad to finish it up with a fishing story with luke or of some favorite memory because luke couldn't join us tonight he's on a third shift schedule right now so we can't get him in the studio but um still you know he's big into the outdoors just on the water instead of in the woods so well i'm going to tell a story uh, and i don't know if anybody here knows this out there in the world of white cat outdoors but i actually have a daughter too I don't know if that's ever been brought up. It might have been briefly know. mentioned okay. that she's so, married to the guy that did the intro, but yeah, that would the, be the guy it. you referred to as a friend earlier who did. He's your my intro. cousin, he's, actually. He's yeah. actually brother. He's mom. actually he's family. family. Yeah. <laughs> See, I, that, it's, I was, I was going to mention that See, earlier. You should have because it's, it, I have a hard time grasping that because I was friends with him before your daughter <laughs> dated him. You know, I I remember driving. I we're both into old Chevys and stuff, and I remember. Yeah driving my chevy over there just so this friend of yours yeah, is actually, he's actually family, family you know? <laughs> sorry sam <laughs> but but anyways uh i'm going to tell a story about a time i had both of my children out and they were young before they could old enough to hunt and i could sit and tell favorite stories about hunting There's with my so son until favorites. you're blue in the face and then you're not going to find a you know father more proud to watch his son shoot something or have some success in the woods i mean i could like i said i'll talk all day about it until you're tired of listening to me but the story i'm going to tell involved both of my children and they couldn't have been eight or nine years old we were re- really young and this was before the mentor program so oh we yeah I mean, they, they were just tagging along and it was a turkey hunt and, uh, <laughs> he already knows the I story. think I heard that story. <laughs> it's my favorite story to tell about the kids growing up. So so I got my two kids, and, and we go walking in the woods to turkey hunt, and we're just getting to where I wanted to set up. And as we start slowing down to you know, look for that spot to sit and just listen, it's still dark out. Wouldn't you know we walked right underneath the birds, blew them out of the roost. So I was like, damn it. You know, it wasn't... wasn't what I had planned for the morning. You know, I really wanted this, some action to happen for the kids. You know, you're with them. So we blew these birds out of the roost walking in. And I'm like, well, what are we going to do? So I was like, well, we'll just walk deeper into the woods. I got another spot. It's going to take us 20 minutes to get there. But we'll get there. It'll be a little later than I would want to be setting up. But you, you got to deal the, play the cards you're dealt sometimes. So we get back into a spot back by an old what we always called a shooting range it was kind of a big old field back in the middle of the square kind of hidden from uh yeah i i, I know where you, you're you, talking i'm sure yeah, yeah anyone, we know where you're anyone talking. familiar with the square we're hunting up, up behind my parents place you know what nobody the shoot, else needs you know to know what the shooting yeah. range is so we got set up up there and i start calling a little bit and i got you know my daughter on one side of me my son on the other side and like i said they couldn't have been eight or nine years old they were little you know then we're sitting there, and lo and behold, we get an answer way off in the distance. It's like, okay, well, at least, you know, the kids got to hear a bird talk. You know, I was kind of happy about that. You know, morning's shaping up a little bit. And uh, make a couple more calls, and, you know, you hear another response, but it sounded like a different bird. You know, same direction, but a different bird. And uh, it's like, all right. So we sat there, and, and things kind of started off a little slow, but... You know, as as we called and listened and called and listened, you know, things heated up and the birds got more aggressive with their calling. You could tell there was, you know, two or three birds, you know, in the group. And they're coming, you know. So we're sitting there and you know, look at the kids and you tell them, okay, let's just, we got to sit still. We got to be quiet. There's something that's going to happen. You know, they're they're coming now. So they're hooked. And uh, 
as they get closer and closer and you can look down through the woods you can see and it turned out there was three jakes and a good long beard you know nice nice mature bird and they're getting closer and closer and and there's it was pretty thick where we were sitting but i had a nice little lane off my left hand shoulder and the birds came through and it was one jake popped through there about 25 yards out i mean it was like perfect you know we'd gone silent all we had to do was watch and the kids could you know, got to see everything play out and the first jake walked through second jake walked through and i'm just sitting there all you know this is it i'm gonna pop this nice long beard he had nine ten inch beard maybe more good thick brush third jake walks through and i'm just waiting for him to step into my shoot lane out from behind this thicket and just as he gets ready to hit that lane to shoot all their heads go red and boom they turn and bolt and the gobbler bolts first jake back through the same spot second jake back through the same spot the third jake hits and i pulled the trigger i just i wanted to shoot something for the kids yeah you know, i really wanted the gobbler they didn't care about the beard size. well no i mean at this point it was more about you know shooting a bird for the kids you know getting them to see the whole thing play out boom i shoot the jake you know which i don't know i normally don't shoot jakes but you know, with the, with that's what kids. we all say. Yeah, as you say, we, we all say that until <laughs> the Jake. Times. <laughs> that, yeah. Honestly, that, that was what almost twenty years ago, yeah. and it's the last Jake I've ever shot. So I can't say the same. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I, I pull the trigger as this last Jake comes through, and and he piles up. He's flopping and kicking and stuff, and we go running over there, and the kids are all excited, and they're like, "Oh my God, we got a deer! Or we got a turkey! We got a turkey! Look at that! Oh, that was great!" And that, and that. So we get over there, and I'm standing on the you know, over by the bird and holding him down so he doesn't, like, jump up and take off, which we've heard is a common occurrence at the table tonight. Yes. So, and and while we're talking, you know, and everybody's you know, looking at the bird and excitement's high and stuff, and the kids start talking about the hunt, you know, and everything that's happened that morning, and my daughter tells her version of the story, you know, about, oh, that was so neat, you know, we got to watch this and that, and da 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 and she gives out her version of the story. And this whole time, I'm trying to figure out what went wrong. You know, I should have had the gobbler. I should have had that mature bird. You know, what, you know, I didn't move. I was set up before the first Jake ever stepped into my shooting lane. I watched three birds walk through. No problem. Yeah, and turkeys, you pretty much, like, they're not like deer. Like, if, no, if they're heading that they're, direction, they're, they're, they're all going to do going. it. going. That was what they were doing, you know. I mean, they weren't, but three yards apart, each bird, you know. It was so... But I listen to my daughter tell her story about it, and she's all excited. And, you know, then my son starts telling his version of the story, and he's like, oh, Dad, that was the coolest thing, you know. We got to watch him birds, and we saw the gobbler, you know, gobble. And he goes, and then the Jake started walking through. He goes, and I knew we were going to get one. He goes, and just before that gobbler stepped through the hole, he goes, I reached up and plugged my ears because I knew you were going to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I was taught my firearm safety, and part of that is ear- hearing ear- protection. Hearing protection. Well, the light bulb came on. You're I like, know. Uh... <laughs> no, what, what ended the deal? Classic move. <laughs> I timed it perfect. <laughs> timed it perfect. His ears were protected. But, but uh, great story. We still a successful hunt. I mean, the kids. Yeah, you know, I mean everything was fantastic. Jake's taste just the same as long beards. Absolutely, they do. And, and, and like I said, at that point. You know, in listening to the stories and stuff over the years, uh, that Jake is probably the, the best bird I've ever shot uh, yeah. over the years. And I've killed birds with 11-inch beards and inch and a quarter spurs and stuff like yeah. that. And, and well, to this day, that Jake still my favorite story. One point Without to make. <laughs> one point to make. I mean, you didn't even mention like the size of the beard of that turkey, which to me, point like you talk about all the details with your kids and everything. Like it didn't even matter. Like, you said it was a Jake, but like, it didn't matter what size that bird was. It was just oh. the fact that you were with your kids, and no, that's, no, and that's that was the it. stuff that, that sticks was, out. No, and that was um, it. Like I said, to this day, that that's still my I, favorite I couldn't turkey. Tell you, I couldn't story. tell you. I mean, a buck's different because the points are very obvious, but, like, I don't, I couldn't tell you how big the bird was that I shot in my dad's lap. I know it was a Jake, and I know mm-hmm. I was looking for the beard through the feathers when we were skinning it out, but <laughs> that's beside the point, you know. I mean, yeah. like I said, it's the... The trophy's in the hunt, not it, it in the really size is. of the animal. It um, truly is. The, the experience is I've always lived with. by, um, 
shoot uh, as long as it's legal i'll throw that disclaimer out first if it gets you excited shoot it yes um i i understand the people that you know they want to get bigger bucks and that's fine because some like this year we had a really big buck roaming the property um and I set my sights on that buck, and I, I'll be honest, I didn't get excited with other bucks walking by, um, and so I, I, I didn't shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's just like I said, get excited and have well, fun. Absolutely. I mean, like I said, the, the, it's the hunt, not necessarily the killing of a particular animal. It's, it's what went into that. And, yeah. and if you're somebody who's never shot a deer before, well, why should you be waiting for a 20-inch 12-point? Yeah, when a perfectly legal deer is giving you the opportunity to create a good memory, if you're happy with it, shoot the, it by the, all means. The shoot smallest it. part of the story is the size of that deer. Absolutely. There's there's a 20 minute lead up of the memory. You know, it starts you know the night before opening day. Yes. and all everything that comes out there's just so it's a long story. Everything mm-hmm. and then it's like it ends with and it was this big and, and then that's it. You know yeah. the the bulk of the story, the meat of that story is the memories that are attached to that deer. It's not, or Absolutely. turkey or any, it's not, it's not the size of the animal. And I think anybody that's ever told a hunting story understands most of the story is not about the size of the animal. It's most, the experience. most of the really good stories don't involve what is typically referred to as a trophy animal. Yeah. It, 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 it Sometimes it, it doesn't around, involve any killing. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Yeah. It, it revolves around the people you were with, the experience that you were having, the, everything that led up to that moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, like your dad's story earlier, shot a, his first deer, everything that led up to it, and in the end, it got away. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like, wow. But, yeah, I mean, that but, was still, I'm sure you had a blast. But it's a memorable experience, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it. Uh, we, we put too much emphasis sometimes on the size of something rather than the experience. That, yeah, just get out there and enjoy it. it. Yes, absolutely. Um, I do, yeah, at this point, I do want to thank you guys, especially. Um, well, we have one well, more story yet. What? Oh yeah! The, oh jeez! I have, you're you're leaving your man. You're leaving your brother. It's out? because he's got to work and he's not sitting at the table. <laughs> you, know, you think you know? Well, we boss, want we want to hear it. Yeah, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll step back. Yeah, let's definitely. I want to hear this story too. And with all that being said, unfortunately, in Luke's case, I think bigger is better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's into fishing, and uh, one of my favorite stories with Luke fishing is uh, he's always wanted to fish the ocean because. Apparently the fish are bigger in the ocean than the, than the <laughs> there, that is fresh a water around home. <laughs> and uh, we ended up, we had an opportunity to do some deep sea fishing um, down in, I believe, outside of Virginia Beach. We went down and uh, got on a charter boat that took us offshore. I want to say it was about 60 about miles, 60 miles out because it took every bit of three, three and a half hours to get out there. And uh, we were fishing... Um, for some marlin and tuna. Uh, tuna and uh so luke it was kind of based around luke because he's the one that really i mean he has a a desire for fishing like nobody it's I've a it's met. an addiction i, mean, I would he's pretty good at it though <laughs> he's very very good yeah i get but to see the picture he's, he's good. always he's wanted very good. to catch something big out of the ocean so we ended up going offshore and, and uh lo and behold he we put him in the chair and it was kind of like the uh old boat on jaws or that big white chair and the cup to put the seat belt butt of the rod in and the clip it on and yeah it was the big footboard to put your feet up on and boats in reverse you, you yeah. really had to work the poles and the poles were thick i mean the line looked like you could use it for a weed whacker string <laughs> I mean, and oh, uh, the, re- the reels were enormous on it, it yeah, was i remember ridiculous. what they were some pen something or other but yeah they were, i don't even want to know what those things cost i mean they're they give them Penn Internationals away. They're, oh, they're yeah. cheap. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure yeah. they do. Yeah, it's like a buy one, get so, two free oh, thing okay, okay. at Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> we gave, we right gave the Luke, ugly sticks. Luke the, uh, the opportunity to sit in the chair first, and he had first dibs on, on the first first bite. And I don't even remember. We weren't on the water all that long. and uh, Not counting the ride out, but right. we got but to yeah, our I mean, fishing spot. Once yeah. we got our actual water, bait out yeah. and, and we're trolling for for a game fish marlin and that uh it was probably within a half hour we had a hit and we had one i on think luke him. was already sitting in the seat at this point oh, he, yeah, he, was he, was he, he, he knew who, had, who was getting the first <laughs> oh, yeah. fish I think he probably bought, as soon as we got to the spot i think he threw that buckle on was ready to rip yeah. Yeah. and uh just in case up, anybody was wondering yeah <laughs> he ended up reeling it in for 
Oh, it probably took every bit of a half an hour. And we did throw it in reverse. You fish you that big, fish. you kind of chase them down. Well, I mean, it's not like... Are you hiding what this fish is in the size? or Not till the end. Okay, well, well, I mean, do you want to give away like the size of the fish, or do you want to wait till the end? Well, wait till the end. Yeah, we okay. didn't know what the size was till we okay. got it to the boat. Why don't you let him tell the story, Nick? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyhow, it took a good half hour, and I mean, we it, we actually did see it jump. It was a, it ended up it was um, it was a blue marlin, and uh, we seen it shoot out of the water a couple times, and I uh, knew it was pretty good size. I, mean, I don't know. The, a whole our lot captain about and marlin first mate have seen. But, a lot yeah so it like uncle frank judging a moose he can tell right. you within an inch or two of the size of a moose yeah. these guys know you know they see a marlin they can tell you how big it is yeah we ended up we got it up to the boat we didn't bring it in the boat just for safety reasons and we had planned to release it anyway we weren't keeping it so there was no sense in doing any more damage to the fish than necessary so we got it to the side of the boat and cut the line and i guess there's a it's called there's a sea witch yeah that's at the Base Basically of the at the line. hook almost. Yeah, right at the hook. And if you get to the sea witch and uh, grab it, grab the sea witch and and cut the line between that witch and the in the fish and let it go, then it's classified as a catch. Gotcha. Um, which we ended up getting. He got a citation <clears throat> for it. Ended up it was uh, estimated. By the way, a citation is a good thing. Yeah. In this case, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, a mark of a big fish. It's not like a citation, like a it's fine. like a trophy. <laughs> yeah. 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 So he, he got a, a trophy, a, a citation, citation for trophy. $400 for that fish. <laughs> but, uh, they had estimated it at uh, 450 pound blue marlin. So And at it that time, he was probably That's a heck about of a fish. 70 pounds. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it took him a little while to get it up to the boat. We ended up catching some tuna, some yellowfin tuna, and white a couple, marlins. couple white marlins. But that, that was pretty impressive. And the guy, our captain, had a. Um, what are those head cams? The GoPros. GoPro on his on his helmet, and uh, had filmed it all. So he was going to send us the copy of the film because we had a couple nice shots of it jumping out of the water. And unfortunately, mail's really slow. We uh, contacted him for about a year and a half to try to get that footage, and never never, never happened. Get it. That's uh that's pretty neat though, because yeah, four hundred and fifty pound blue marlin isn't typically a fish you think about catching off the shores of Virginia. You know, people talk about blue marlin fishing, and you think about... You Costa know, Rica. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, the, the so, Bahamas. and well, we found out. You know, um, off of coast of Florida and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, anywhere but Virginia. Virginia. Beach. <laughs> you know, so Mid-Atlant- we, Mid-Atlantic states, you know. <laughs> we found out in the course of, like, researching, you know, fishing trips and different times of the year that we had vacationed in different locations that there's actually basically like the marlins and tuna work from florida all the way to maine um and it's different times of the year um that you're going to hit them in different states basically Mm -hmm. um you know we've we fished virginia beach myrtle beach we fished out of florida um there's it's just depends on the time of year what you're going to get in that area and like i said it you don't typically think virginia beach has got marlin but it, it, it if does, you hit yeah. it at the right time of the it year produced that day yeah. yeah i mean we actually yeah we got one blue and two whites um mm-hmm. and a couple tuna which um did you just keep the tuna for oh yeah for dinner oh yeah actually we gave some to some dude on the dock too we yeah. first got this is kind of just a funny side story we were first got up I mean, it was it had to be before five in the morning we're getting on the boat because you got several hours to get out to where you're fishing and uh there's some you know i don't I don't know where where he came from or anything, but some shirtless dude, super tan, like probably lives out on the docks, um, came by, saw that we were getting on the charter, and he said, hey, you catch any fish, you know, throw me a bone, you know, and we're like, okay, and we came back, and we had two big tuna um, that we were flaying out, and he had, he was sticking around, and we gave him a few tuna steaks, just, I mean, mm-hmm. what, I mean, we had enough tuna to last the entire year right so i mean two tuna for a family of five and one doesn't <laughs> even eat seafood you got plenty of tuna right. so we gave us some to some dude we didn't even know and we were just happy to get out there and fish but good story yeah good story so but now i think now that the stories have sufficed um i want to thank both you guys for joining us on the podcast and um not only you guys but all dads out there that uh get their kids outdoors um, because it's, I, in my friend group and family, um, it's a pretty steady trend that you know, dads that hunt 
produce kids that hunt. Um, and it's important to get your kids outside and off of video games and stuff like that. I'm not saying I don't enjoy them, but I prefer to be out in the woods or on the water. Um, and I feel like more kids need that in their life. So I appreciate all the dads that enjoyed the outdoors and taught their kids the same thing at a young age. I remember, especially me and Tom, and I'm sure Frank's the same way. As soon as we found out why my dad was getting up so early on Saturdays in the fall, I wanted to be there. Like it wasn't, I didn't care that I couldn't shoot anything. I just wanted to get in the tree stand with him. And I'm sure my dad knew that if I went, probably not going to see anything. Um, but you know, he always let us go with him. Um, it's just why we're still doing it today. But um, before we totally wrap it up, uh, we one thing we do every week is the write it in pen. Um, so I want to flip it over to my dad for his write it in pen. That's anybody that listens. Um, knows what the write it in pen is, but we've had um, this past week um, quite a few new subscribers I've noticed. Um, so to just to explain what the write it in pen is, um, is basically just anytime we bring a guest on, we like to get some sort of tidbit, um, valuable information from them that you're going to want to write in pen. Refrain from using tidbit. That's a terrible word. I wouldn't. You know, I was going to a really good sentimental thing here, and you just, you know, just for future reference, I'm going to say tidbit two more times before this podcast ends. Uh, uh, so I'd like my dad to give some sort of tidbit information uh, that, you know, is something that you want to write in pen uh, and just leave people that you don't want to forget it. Okay. Uh, so write this in pen. If you uh, enjoy outdoors and the nature and want to preserve it, I think, you know, your best bet when you're out there, if you if you ever run across some trash or you know a pop can, there's always a pop can, a beer can, an empty shell casing, a sandwich or candy wrapper bag, something laying in there that doesn't belong out there. Put it in your pocket and dispose of it properly. Keep keep the outdoors clean and uh, so everybody down the road can enjoy it for years to come. That's a perfect Gr- thing to leave it with. Great advice. Great advice. No, we actually, last, during shed season, we had even tried to start a little campaign, Sheds and Trash, um, that basically, you know, while you're out there hiking miles and miles looking for sheds, pick up some trash while you're out there, too. Um, so, <clears throat> that's perfect, you know, clean up the woods that you're in. Yeah. So, that about sums it up here um, for tonight. Um, happy Father's Day to everybody listening. If you're a father or father-to-be, um, make sure you continue to get your kids and get them outdoors get them hunting fishing and you know get outside sounds good thanks for having me nick tom frankie thanks Thanks a lot for being here yep thanks a lot guys we appreciate you